ahead and record that and then you need to accept that on your screen. Okay. I and, forgot I was supposed to remind you to record it. Oh, that's okay. That's <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, please, if you do remember to remind me, sometimes I have a funny way of leading up to where I want to be. And so I intentionally don't start the recording. So if you had reminded me, I'd say, yeah, okay, just a second, I'm going to do it. So, but yeah, if I start lecturing on the material and I haven't started recording, please, if you, you know, and I don't mean to burden Kellen with it, but if you, um, whoever can remember, please, you know, yell out and say, hey, record this. Yeah, it's going to do that. I don't understand it. There is no rhyme or reason as to why once I begin the class, maybe it has something to do with me logging into Zoom is all I can think of. Um, then the PDF annotator does not work properly. And so I go through this process of closing the PDF annotator, opening it again, realizing it's still not going to work, which means I'm going to have to reboot my machine, which means you'll see me sitting here rebooting my machine, but you're going to lose the feed of my screen, but I will log back in and uh, then it tends to work after I go through that process for some weird reason. And maybe what I should do is log into Zoom and go through the process before class starts uh, is maybe gonna be the answer to this because I don't understand why it does this. But let me log out and I'll be back uh, with the screen. You'll still see me, but you won't hear me. And uh, I'll come back and um, we should be able to run PDF annotator correctly at that point. So hang on guys. Okay, you can hear me, right? And let me share my screen. You can see my screen. 
Okay. So far, so good. All I need to do is pretty much have it and uh, I think we'll be there. Okay. I don't know what to tell. It's just bizarre. Okay. Anyway, so let's go ahead and let's take a look. And we're going to start out talking about capital structure. Now, uh, when we get into the capital structure discussion, um, we're going to see that this tends to be about a 10 point area on the, um, excuse me, a five point area on the bar exam. Um, we're gonna spend some time uh, together with some of the parts of this discussion, but there are going to be other pieces where they just start throwing um, formula after formula after it at us. And I'm gonna ask you to look at some of that stuff where at some point um, it just starts to choke off any ability to have a discussion about this is it's just one formula after the other. And I'll just ask you to kind of look at some of that stuff on your own. Uh, we'll get to working capital management, okay? That tends to be about five points on the exam. Financial valuation models and uh, financial decision models. Um, these tend to be about 10 points. This is where we'll start getting more into managerial accounting aspects uh, of the discussion that have been uh, on the exam for a long time or things that examiners have always uh, focused some time on. We'll talk a little bit about marginal analysis together. We we'll probably won't get to this stuff on the bottom part of this until next week. Uh, that tends to be about five points. So as we start to take a look at uh, capital structure here, okay, and um, what we're basically going to be looking at are the various ways that a company can finance various activities. And what we're really looking at is what would be a good mix between debt and equity financing if a company has a project or something that they're trying to um, finance. And through this process, we'll see that we'll come up with something called a weighted average cost of capital. And that weighted average cost of capital is then something that's used for some of these other discussions that we get in later, where we start talking about internal rate of return, net present value method, et cetera. So we're really kind of giving you some background in this section as to how you come up with some of the uh, information that is used to make these various decisions uh, using these different tools, like we'll talk about uh, net present value next time. So let's just turn to the uh, second section here, dealing with the weighted average cost of capital. And it'll tell us that the weighted average cost of capital serves as a major link between the long-term investment decisions associated with the corporation's capital structure and the wealth of a corporation's owner. And as I've stated, this weighted average cost of, cost of capital is often used as an internal hurdle rate for capital investment decisions. It can be used in uh, tools such as the net present value method. Uh, and we'll talk about internal rate of return, et cetera. So the mixture of debt and equity financing that produces the lowest weighted average cost of capital maximizes the value of the firm. Okay. Now, when you look on the next page, and again, this is discussion in this chapter in this part of this chapter is very formula driven but some of these that are sort of key formula i'm going to go to with over together uh, when we get to some of these sort of different ones that you have gordon's you know formula for calculating the value of the company and that sort of thing then i'm not going to spend as much time with those because it starts to become a hodgepodge of you know boutique uh, ways of measuring the value of a company and stuff. And I just don't want to spend our time with that. But taking a look, um, what we would do is we'd come up with the cost of each specific type of capital price proportion to the firm's total capital structure, okay? So basically, if you look at the weighted average cost of capital, we have the sum market values of individual components of the firm's capital structure. We have common stock, which is E, 
the preferred stock, which is P, and debt, which is D. So we sum the components and that becomes the numerator here in these fractions that you're seeing uh, listed. Then we would come up with the required rate of return, also known as the cost of the various components, okay? Now notice that we have a cost for our uh, common stock, our E. We have a cost for our preferred stock, the P, and we have a cost for our debt here, the D. Okay, or I guess it's a little D there for debt. But notice, and it's the only one of the components that we figure that out after tax. Why? Because interest on debt is tax deductible, whereas dividends that are paid on preferred and common stock are not deductible. So T becomes the corporate tax rate. Okay, so the cost after you consider tax, if the tax rate was say, well, excuse me, if the tax was say, tax rate was say 30%, one minus the 30% would give us what? Would give us a 0.7 after tax cost of capital. And that's how we'll use that information. Okay, so when you take a look, um, Note that only T is uh, applied to the uh, the debt. Okay, so you can put that in there, debt only. And then um, we're going to see that the appropriate percentages of each of these is what uh, is available in the market. So just coming over, and I think that looking at the examples is useful for all of these. So when you're going back over this and you're making a flashcard, did I tell you flashcard that formula? Okay, I want you to flashcard that formula. And remember, you have a, a pre-made set of flashcards that came with the package that you acquired for the class here. Um, I would be willing to bet a buck that this formula already has a flashcard, but if it does not, please make this flashcard and memorize it, okay? And um, then in this particular example, they give us the parts uh, for each one of these. Now we're gonna see here in a little while that we're gonna see how to calculate these different uh, costs here, but here they go ahead and they give this to us. So they say, assume the cost of common stock equity is 8.4. So they give us that cost. Um, the cost of preferred stock is 6.8%. And the weighted average interest rate on the company's debt, okay, is going to be 6%, okay? And then they tell us also assume that the market value for the percentages of each component, so they give us the components here, is 55% common stock, 20% preferred stock, and 25% debt. Now... As I'm seeing this question, um, you know, you wouldn't have a whole uh, lot to do because they're kind of giving each one of these to you, right? So they're telling us 55%, 20%, and 25%. So they're basically giving us this number, right? They're inside here. And then they're going ahead and they're applying the cost respectively to each one of them down here once they bring those percentages down, okay? Now, the only one that gets kind of, you know, where you maybe would have wanted to pull your calculator out here for looking at this particular example anyway, is to say, well, 60% times one minus or 70% gives me the 42% after tax cost of the debt, which again, they told us is 25% of the structure here. And so this company's weighted average cost of capital is 7.03. And presumably then the company would go ahead and they would use that weighted average cost of capital as their hurdle rate, if they're calculating an internal rate of return, if they're using that present value method, that would be the required rate of return that you would use for all the calculations, et cetera. Okay. Now notice here that these elements that we were talking about tend to be long-term in nature. Uh, for shorter term borrowing for a project and 
which um, there is usually no interest associated with that. For example, if we're going to be taking advantage of the accounts payable vehicle and we're going to be getting you know, some supplies and we're gonna get a 30 day window to pay for that or something, there's generally not an interest associated with that. Now be careful if you get a CPA exam question that sits there and gives you a interest rate with it, then use that. But typically, uh, that that's not the case. So um, don't you know kill yourself looking for an interest rate. If they'll say we're going to be financing our account payable over thirty days or something, if they don't give you an interest rate for that, don't worry about it. Okay. Now we come over and we take a look at the uh, weighted average cost of debt. And as I've warned, you know the. Um, the each one of these can have some formula associated with it, but I think it's worth going through some of these together because again, this um, this um, weighted average cost of capital calculation feeds into other areas, and so we might as well understand how to come up with the cost with each one of the elements. So we're basically looking at how they come up with those R's. They gave us the R's up there, but how would you have to uh, calculate these? And as often is formula driven, okay? So starting with the weighted average cost of debt, you would use the weighted average interest rate for that. Flashcard that if you don't already have the card in your flashcards, but if you look, it's pretty straightforward. It's debt outstanding for the period and you divide that into the effective annual interest payments that the company is making, that would give you the weighted average interest rate associated with that. That would give us the R for the debt. And then again, remember uh, for debt, we're talking about what? We're talking about the after tax cost of debt because interest is deductible, right? And so when you look at the after tax cost of debt, okay, because the interest is tax deductible, we would compute the after tax cost. So the after tax cost is whatever the pre-tax cost was times, and we saw in the example, since the interest rate was uh, 30, per, uh, excuse me, the, the tax rate was 30%, one minus the 0.3 would give us 0.7, the after tax rate. Okay, so let's just go ahead and take a look. And I do think it's helpful to look at the examples, you know, you kind of go through and you look at some of the formula for these. And then there are often examples that follow that are helpful to bring some of this, you know, home for you. But they say, assume the long-term debt component of the weighted average cost of capital for a firm includes a pre-tax cost of debt. And here they just gave us the 12.5%. So they kind of jumped that first calculation and they're just showing us again uh, much how we saw for the previous example in fact I don't even know why I'm going through this again could it be to take that times one minus the tax rate and that gives us the after tax okay okay good now you come over and let's take a look at the cost of preferred stock okay now when we look at the cost of preferred stock the real factor that's causing or driving the cost is if the company is paying any preferred stock dividends, okay? And we would need to divide that by the net proceeds of preferred stock. Now you come over and, you know, we're gonna look at each component of this, uh, basically this fraction, this formula here. And the preferred stock dividend can be stated as a dollar amount or a percentage, for example, 5% preferred stock pays an annual dividend of 5% of par value if dividends are declared by the corporation. Um, corporations, as you know, do not have to declare dividends, right? That's why uh, often in an early stages of a company's development, they're not going to pay dividends because they're using the capital that they're getting in for different various projects and whatnot, right? Okay. Net proceeds would be after you go ahead and you issue the preferred stock and you would have to subtract though any um, issuance costs associated except associated with that uh, issuance okay so let's just go ahead and take a look and we say that assume that the and I want you to flash card guys the way you calculate these 
So not only the formula, but it's helpful to have the components of the formula. Okay, and then we come over and we say, assume that the preferred stock component of the weighted average cost of capital for a firm is 10%. So they just went ahead and told us the cost. And a $100 par value stock was issued uh, at par with a flotation cost of $5 per share. So we already have the what, and they told us this is gets a little redundant here, guys, and that they tell you that it's 10% and that's on a hundred dollar par, that gives us $10 is the dividend. Okay. But we need to know what we need to know to take off those issuance costs off of that. And so if you take the $10 divided by the $95 the net proceeds, that gives us then the you know, percentage, right? The weighted average, uh, not the weighted average, but the cost of the preferred stock. Again, we're going through these components uh, one at a time that we saw in the weighted average cost of capital formula. Now you come over and we start talking about cost of retained earnings. And um, it gets a little bit confusing here to say, cost of retain earnings, well, what do they mean by that? And they're basically talking about the uh, cost of the common stock component, okay? So again, remember we had the debt cost, which we looked at, the preferred stock cost, which we looked at, and now we're looking at the cost of the common stock, but here they're calling it cost of retain earnings, okay? So the three common methods of computing the cost of retain earnings, one is the capital asset pricing model, the other is a discounted cash flow approach, and the other is the bond yield premium um, approach, um, bond yield plus premium approach. Um, I mean, probably that last one is the easiest, probably the most commonly asked will be the capital asset pricing model for you on your exam, okay? Um, I find, and maybe I've just been beaten into submission on some of this stuff, but I find that the capital asset pricing model is kind of fun to look at and think about and use a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and flashcard the, uh, that formula and apply it here in a couple of minutes. But let's take a look at some of the key assumptions here. Okay, so cost of retain earnings is equal to the risk-free rate of return plus a premium. Now they don't um, call out what the risk-free rate is, but the risk-free rate of return really is tied to the risk associated with federal government debt, okay, treasury securities. That's really where you would get the risk-free rate. That's why it's always a little annoying to me when I hear them talk about not raising the debt ceiling. And there are people that sit there and say, yeah, just default on the federal government's debt. And I'm like, do you understand the ramifications to the capital markets associated with that? Because when we're making decisions about how to finance various capital projects and we're trying to come up with the cost of our common stock, we would start with a risk-free rate of return that sort of allows all this to move forward. If there is no risk-free return, how do corporations make decisions about what the cost of various projects and what are going to be? And that's just one of many, you know, the issues associated with the idea of the federal government defaulting on its debt. But anyway, let me stop there. Uh, you come over, and I always feel like when I hear somebody say that, like they got maybe they got abducted by aliens, and now just they're you know, image, the body snatchers have come and taken them and replaced them with somebody that's willing to say that because that's ridiculous. Anyway, the market risk premium is equal. Okay, so we have that market risk premium piece that we're going to add to the risk free rate. And it's equal to the systematic. And remember, we talked last time about non-diversifiable -diver risk. So there's some amount of risk because of war and whatnot, general economic factors that you cannot diversify out by diversifying in your portfolio. Okay, so that's the market risk premium. Now we look at that and we say, well, look, some companies have a risk that is more or less volatile or could be exactly equal, but 
we tend to think of them as being more or less volatile than the overall non-diversifiable market risk, okay? So we come up with a beta coefficient, okay? And it measures the volatility of the risk of the stock relatively to the overall market. So if you had one, that would mean the stock is just as volatile as the market. But usually that beta factor is either going to be greater than, okay, greater than, or less than one, okay? And um, that means that the stock is what? If it's greater, that means that the stock is what? More volatile. If it's less, if it's uh, less than one, that means that what? That means that that stock is less volatile than the market, okay? Greater than one, more volatile, less than one, less volatile than the market. Uh, the risk premium, is the stock beta coefficient multiplied by the market risk premium. And then to get the market risk premium, we have to subtract off the risk-free because we're going to deal with the risk-free up front. And that overall market uh, does include the risk-free piece. Okay. So go ahead and flashcard right here. Okay. We're going to take the risk-free rate of return, which the problem will give you, you'll have a beta and you'll have to know that you're going to multiply that beta times the um, times the market risk uh, premium. And then once you come up with that, you will go ahead and multiply that market return minus the risk-free rate. And that's going to give you the um, risk premium. So let's just look at that. Okay. And you have assume Okay, and you really just need to flashcard that last part, guys. Assume that a firm's beta is 1.25, the risk-free rate of return is 8.75, and the market rate of return is 14.25%. Uh, now, if I'm looking at this, I'm sitting here and saying, well, look, okay, I know I've got to have this number. I would write that number down. I'm going to scratch paper in the exam because I know I've got to use that and then I'm going to adjust that for whatever this particular company's uh, risk premium is, okay? So I go ahead and I take 1.25, that was their beta, and I multiply it, but I just want to measure what? The residual risk, because I've already dealt with the risk-free up front there, right? And so that residual risk there, after you subtract out the risk-free for this, for the overall market is this 0 0.0550. But I now need to what? To um, amplify that for this particular one, because it's more than one. And so that gives me the 0 0.0688, add them together. That's the cost of using common stock, the cost to retain earnings assuming you use the capital asset pricing model. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> another way would be to use the discounted cash flows. Okay. And the expected growth rate may be based on projections of past growth rates, a retention growth model, or analysis forecast. Okay. So let's just take a look at this formula for the cost of retained earnings. Okay. And again, this is using the discounted cash flow and they're calling it cost of retained earnings, but we're really trying to come up with the cost of our common stock here to use in our weighted, in our, uh, weighted average cost of capital model. Okay. And notice here, they say, well, you have your dividend at the current price and then uh, you add a growth factor to that. And that's going to be the cost of paying dividends, which is the cost of the dividends on your common stock. Not, we already did it for the, uh, for the preferred stock. So we come over current market price of the outstanding common stock, the dividend per share expected at the end of one year, and then you bring in that constant growth rate. So again, very formula driven part of our discussion, okay, uh, for, for the bar exam. And you come over and we say, well, assume that the firm has a constant growth firm that just paid an annual common dividend of $2 has a dividend growth rate of 7.5% and the current market price for the stock is 25, um, 
25. Now, notice uh, here, guys, to come up with D1. Okay, here we sort of say, well, here's D1. But notice they gave us what? They gave us the dividend uh, paid annually in the common stock, and it just paid a dividend of um, $2. Well, to get what we believe the dividend will be by the end of the year, we're going to have to go ahead and do what? Take that dividend, okay, that D1, and we're going to have to, uh, D naught, I should say, and to turn it into D1, you'd have to multiply it times one plus the growth rate. So you, you have to read the question carefully to see if they're asking you, if they're giving you the D1 dividend or the D naught dividend. Often you're going to have to calculate D1, which is not necessarily something that they showed us in the formula up there, but note that if they give you the most recently paid dividend and uh, the current market price for the common stock, you have to turn that into what you think the dividend will grow to by the next time they pay dividend because they had already paid that dividend at that point. So you go ahead and you do that math. You have the now D1, and then you can go ahead and come up with the um, current uh, dividend rate and then you simply add the growth rate to it and when you get that then you get the um, discounted cash flow code for the cost of the common stock okay so to me the only trick there is just be careful that you turn that just don't pick up the dividend that you have to turn it to what the next dividend will be the d1 dividend now um the bond yield premium okay and bond yield premium to me is the easiest one um it's not the most interesting but it certainly is easy <laughs> okay and basically what you look at is the pre-tax cost of long-term debt and then you add a market premium and the problem would have to give you that okay so or maybe you know, the most interesting they'll get is they won't give you the, um, um, yeah, well, they'll give you the pre-tax cost of debt. So when I looked at this earlier, I'm like, okay, that's all there is to this. That's not very interesting, but at least it's easy. Okay, so what happened? Assume a firm has estimated its market rate premium 4.5% and has determined that the yield maturity on its own bond is 11.34%. And you just simply add that okay now you know a company can choose which of these approaches they want to use i tend to think that this capital uh, asset pricing model is the one that kind of seems most scientific to me but um you know different companies could use different methods you need to know all three of these uh, for the exam purposes, I mean, discounted cash flow seems to me to be a little um, unrealistic that we're going to have this constant growth of the dividend rate over time, et cetera. So I would think that most companies would like that capital asset pricing model. Okay. Now, what you could do is you could basically um, use an average of all three if you wanted to. So you could use all three of those methods and then use an average of the three. So you'd come up with the, uh, the cost of capital for each one of those, divide by three and use that average. Okay. All right. So what I want to do, and as you know, the new version of the book does not have class questions. And I think it's helpful for us to stop and let you try a couple questions for the things that we're looking at. So I'm gonna go to the old textbook that shows questions that are relevant to what we've just talked about. And I'm thinking that my poll issue has been fixed. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch that. Yeah, okay, good. Because last time, remember, we couldn't get it to work, but that has been fixed. And so you'll see the poll. I tend to give you guys about two minutes to work these questions. Uh, so I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll give you three for this one since it looks like it might have some calculations.
What's the matter, guys? We're coming up on three minutes. You look a little like uh, nobody's trying this one. You need help? Yeah, I try. Okay, let me, uh, I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to call the dogs off on this one, okay? Um, and I'm going to show you and you're going to go, oh, great. Okay, because uh, the examiners do this, okay? And so this is, this question has more to do with um, test taking technique than it does any of the um, theories or processes or formula or whatever that we've talked about up until now, because what? They come in and they say DQZ Telecom is considering a project for a coming year, which will cost $50 million. DQZ plans to use the following combination of debt and equity to finance the investment. So they're coming up with that 50, 15 million is going to be um, debt, right? Bonds, 35 million is going to be basically stock. They're saying generated from retained earnings. So basically it's going to be um, through um, payments out of the retainers, which is translated into our discussion of the cost of stock, et cetera, okay? Now, where this gets confusing is they start sitting here and giving you, now, uh, let, let me stop for a second. If you're working this problem on the exam, what the first thing, and I'm gonna set it up down here, the first thing I would do is I would say, well, look, I know I've got 15, divided by 50, right? Plus what? Plus 35 divided by 50. And my job is going to be to apply the appropriate cost rate to each of those components that they're using, right? And where you probably got tangled up is the evil examiners. I don't want to call them bastards because that wouldn't be right. But the evil examiners, what they did was they gave you all the pieces you needed to start to calculate these components, including the components you needed for the uh, capital asset pricing model, which is probably where you started to go. But then they tell us that what? Assume the after-tax cost of debt is 7%. Well, if the examiners tell you to assume that, then you have no choice but to do what? Assume that, even though they gave you all these other pieces. So... You have to sit there and you have to put what 0 0.07. They gave me the after tax cost of the debt. And they tell me that assume the cost of equity is what? 12%. They tell me what to assume. I can't, I can't argue with them. You win no argument with the CPA exam question. Okay. So once I do that. Then I can go ahead and I can do the math and I think it comes out to point, point zero two one plus point zero eight four, and that comes to 10.5% or choice A. Okay, so that's annoying. Okay. I don't know, you know, this cost of equity is 12%. They tell us to assume that. And you say, but look, they gave us all the other components and I come up with another number when I use it. Well, maybe they didn't use the capital asset pricing model to come up. It doesn't say that you have to use that. It says that that is one of the tools that you can use. So, you know, you have to sit here and you just had to, that was the key word there. Okay. All right, good. Now let's go ahead and get ourselves some practice using what we've learned about the capital asset pricing model. At this point, if you need to look, go back and look at the formula for this, that's fine. But by the time you're doing your homework for this section, you should pretty much have this memorized, right? So you're practicing using your memorization of it when you're doing the homework. But for today, right, this moment in class together, if you need to look back, that's fine. By the time you're doing these in your homework, you should already have these memorized. Remember the process is what? Go through our notes, make the flashcards that I've asked you to make or make sure you have them in the Becker material, memorize the cards, then work the questions, right? So you're reinforcing um, your memorization of key things.
10 seconds, guys. Okay, looks like everyone's had a chance to um, try this one. And uh, okay, we're at 67% on this. I mean, this is for a small class, one of us. I had a little trouble with this. I, I didn't answer um, as a student. I'm, I'm logged in twice, as you can tell. I didn't answer as a student. But um, let's just go ahead and take a look at this one, okay? And they tell us um, to use the cap in. So here they've instructed us, use the cap M. Now I would have, have memorized that the cap M does what? It starts with the risk-free rate of return, right? So I know I gotta get 6% in there, okay? And so now I'm gonna just have to get that market premium. Now, what um, I would do immediately with this question is look to see if there's any rate that is less than 6%. And I know I gotta get rid of that. Sometimes they may, be testing just at that level, right? But no, all of these are pretty much still in the ball game. Although I'm looking at B, kind of like hmm, I don't know about B. But anyway, then I want to go ahead and I want to get that um, that market premium. Okay, so what happens? I know that there's a what market return is 14 percent. So I take that 14 percent. Okay, but that's not how you make a percentage point, a percentage mark, 14%, okay? But I know that that what has to be adjusted for the risk-free. So I have to back off that risk-free. That leaves the overall residual market now not considering the risk-free. And then I have to, and in this case, I'm going to amplify it by the fact that this company has a beta of 1.25, meaning that it's a little more risky than the general overall market, okay? And when I do the math on that one, then uh, that's how I come up to this, um, what do I get? Uh, do I have, oh, I have to do all the math on this, one, 6% plus what, 8% times 1.25, okay? 6%. Plus what, ten percent? Okay, equals what sixteen percent? Okay, be careful um, when you're you know doing using um, calculations that you're following the proper order of operations or whatnot. That might have some of you up as well. Have to do the work inside the parentheses first, etc. That's why I kind of went through the hassle of showing you how to come up with that. Because if you didn't, then you you somehow tried to not use the proper order of operations that kind of that could have messed you up question um can we go back to the first question really quick yeah, sure um in the in this first part of it where it says issue 15 million for price of 101 with a coupon rate of eight and flotation costs of two percent per par is that enough information to set up CAPM? Uh, issue 15 million 20 year bond at a price of 101 with a coupon rate of 8%. Flotation cost of 2% of par. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Because that's where <laughs> I got stuck is trying to figure out. I mean, I missed the whole assume, but I kept yeah. looking at that thinking that, that I was trying to apply the formula there. Right. And Can we yeah. use cap M for that because it says bonds. Would there be a market return that we involve in that? Um, well, it would, yeah, it, it wouldn't be cap M. That, that's correct. Cap M is really down here. But in terms of your question, the cost of debt, could you get it from all that? If I may rephrase your question, because this is the only part I think what. Um, Kellen, your first name is Kellen, right? Okay. Um, I think what Kellen is saying is this would be where you would be tempted to apply the cap M. Okay, but here you'd be trying to get the cost of the debt. And I'm saying that um, I don't know. Um, I don't think the exam would give you something that complicated to figure out the cost of debt. 
they would tell you the interest rate on the bonds is because what you're going to have to do with all that is you're going to have to come up with an effective interest rate because the bonds are issuing at a premium and then there's um, flotation cost and that gets a little beyond the scope of the exam to make you calculate the cost of the debt. So they would have to tell you the cost that most likely they would tell you the cost of the debt is 7%. And the big wrinkle they like to put in that is they tell you before tax and then they give you the tax rate. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So now I got to remember to go back to the other book, to the real book. Again, if you're wondering, what is he doing? I'm, um, I just pick out questions that are associated with this material in a previous iteration of the course, because I believe, I still believe in this idea of turning you loose and letting you work questions, whereas now days, I guess people feel that that's not necessary. I, unless you guys don't want me to do it, I find it helpful. I think it's helpful. Is it helpful? It's helpful for me. Yeah, I, I think it, it you know, gets you kind of ready for battle, right? Because then you're going to say, okay, now this is how I'm going to attack my homework question. Okay, good. All right, let's come over. And um, when we talk about um, determination of the lowest uh, optimal capital structure and determination of the lowest um, weighted average cost of capital, and it's kind of like um, they build you all up and you're like, oh boy, you're going to tell us how to come up with the lowest weighted average cost of capital. And then they don't. They simply tell you that what the combination of debt and equity, common stock, preferred stock that gives you the lowest average weighted average cost of capital is what the company should be shooting for. But they don't really tell us how to come up with that. I mean, you can... Uh, basically use a lot of things. You could use trial and error. I suppose you could get into some sort of derivative type of calculation to figure that out. But again, that's beyond the uh, scope of the exam. Uh, just know that the company would be looking for that lowest weighted average cost of capital, but uh, they don't tell us how to do that. Okay, It's the combination of the three different uh, components that has the lowest whack that we would choose. Okay. Okay, good. And then I think it is worth noting that um, we do use this um, once we come up with that weighted average cast of cop capital, we could use it as a hurdle rate and we can use it for tools such as, and we'll probably get into these next time, we won't get into them tonight, so we'll definitely get them to next time. Internal rate of return, um, net present value, in which they'll just tell you the hurdle rate is, and just kind of keep in mind, oh, they came up with the optimum cost of capital by configuring out the optimal combination of debt versus equity financing. By the way, um, I think you know this, but um, you know, you don't have to use all three forms of the um, financing. Okay, you could do it entirely through debt, and that may be the optimal way. You could use all retained earnings. You maybe use preferred stock and retained earnings. Maybe you don't have any preferred stock. So you obviously know. In fact, we just looked at a problem, right? Where I don't think they used all three. Okay. Okay, good. Now coming over and looking at asset structure and, you know, we can have current assets. And I think if you made it this far, you know, examples of current assets, accounts receivable, notes receivable, prepaid expenses, non-current things. I think, you know, if you've come this far, that's property, plant, and equipment. So I'm not going to belabor that. Okay. When we look at uh, loan covenants, Okay, and let's just make sure we understand uh, what loan covenants are. Okay, and when a borrower has a significant amount of outstanding debt relative to equity, loan covenants will typically increase and become more stringent because there is more risk for the lender. So what starts to happen is the lender will say, well, look, 
We'll lend you this money, but you must maintain a debt to equity ratio of X percent. And if that debt to equity ratio starts to what climb above a certain percent, they may say the interest rate on the loan is going to increase, or perhaps they're going to call the debt at that point in time. Those are loan covenants. Okay. And they do that for the protection of the lender. Now, when I say they do that for the protection of the lender, the lender requires that for the protection of the lender. Uh, the company who's coming to, you know, want to borrow the money, they kind of have to negotiate what they can so that they can do what? Get their interest rate lower on that debt, if the, especially if the lender is going to say, well, no, you know, um, we're going to charge you a higher interest rate if that, and I'm just using an example, the loan covenant debt to equity ratio gets too high. Okay. Now we come over and we talk about ways to, uh, you know, basically come up with what the, um, the uh, growth and profitability of the company is going to be. And these are different ways that we may want to use to value a business, okay? So the growth rate associated with the company's earnings is a key component of financial valuation. And so a company's annual earnings can be allocated between dividend payments to shareholders and retained earnings. So what we do is we come up with the growth rate we come up with the return on our assets times whatever our retention rate is. And we're going to retain that or retain earnings. And then we will divide that by one minus the return on assets times the retention. And that's the growth rate. So the question becomes, well, then how do we calculate the retention rate? And with the retention rate is equal to the addition to retain earnings divided by net income. This can also be thought of as the portion of net income not paid out in the form of dividends. Now you look at all that and you're like, well, what does that all mean? Well, first off, let's just flashcard that formula. And again, I think you probably have it in your flashcards, but if not, please make that card. And then let's just look at this example, okay? And you can see, that they tell us that the company has a policy of paying out 40% of all of its earnings in dividends. That's kind of a little bit sillyly, sillyly stated. Companies don't have policy on how much of a dividend they're going to pay. They have, you know, his history of the dividends they pay, but dividend payment is really a decision of the board of directors and it's probably decided on annually, okay? And then they make some sort of vote on that. There's not a company policy of dividend, but whatever. Maybe their, their history shows that they pay a dividend of 40%. Well, if they pay dividend of 40%, then that means that the retention rate is not a big deal, 60%, okay? So if that's the retention rate, then just you know, using that formula, okay, if the return on assets is 7.5% and we're going to retain, what, 60% of that return, and then we get the denominator as one minus the uh, retention rate, then we have a growth rate of 4.7%. Okay. Now you come down and profitability. And profitability is a key financial measure of success. And often when we go ahead and we calculate those um, profitability ratio, and here we go, guys, we're going to really start to heavily get into the ratio. I'm going to go through some of the key ones with you. And at some point, I'm going to abandon this belabored discussion of ratio and just ask you to take a look at those because it just becomes ratio after ratio after ratio. And I don't want you to go into a coma on me here as we go through these. Okay. But basically you have the return on sales. Okay. Which is net sales. Net sales is what? Sales minus returns. Okay. Minus returns or any uh, allowances, discounts, and whatnot. Okay, and then we take income before interest, income, interest expense, and taxes. Okay, so they may make you calculate that, and that gives us the return on sales. Okay, return on investment, we take the average invested capital. Um, guys, 
I don't recommend that you do any of you subscribe to the Facebook um, version, Facebook um, groups that are studying for different parts of the exam. Okay, good. Don't um, because they they put a lot of um, really kind of wrong information out, misnomers out and stuff. I look at it just to kind of get a sense of what kind of things sometimes students might be running into while they're doing their homework. And the one that I see a lot is they'll tell you that at the beginning of the year, the average invested, I'm going to abbreviate that, I see invested capital was 100 and the ending uh, you know, invested capital was 170. Okay. And then when the, you look at the solution, what they'll do is they'll, to come up with the average, they'll take 100 plus 170, and then they'll divide it by two. And then students are like, well, I don't understand why you did that. And they divide it by two. Well, if you're trying to get the average of two numbers in the numerator and you want the average of those two numbers, isn't that how you calculate the average? Okay, so that's all they're doing. Okay, so don't, you know, don't give that calculation more credit than it deserves. Okay, um, then what in terms of mystery? Okay, return on assets, net income divided again by the average total assets. Uh, return on equity. See what I'm talking about formula and not wanting to spend a whole bunch of times with each of these. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and let's talk about leverage. Okay. And basically we have two types of leverage that we're interested in. One is operating leverage. The other is financial leverage. Okay. Now, when we talk about operating leverage, leverage, okay, the definition of operating leverage, leverage is the degree to which a company uses fixed operating costs rather than variable operating costs, okay? They tell us that a capital intensive industry, maybe an airline or something, often have higher operating leverage, whereas labor intensive entities, uh, industries generally have low operating leverage. Now, why don't we just go ahead and come up with a quick little flashcard schematic for that? So if our fixed cost are up, okay, then operating leverage is also up. That says operating leverage. I know that's hard to read. If the fixed costs are up, operating leverage is up. Just remember, guys, listen to the words I'm saying rather than trying to read my writing because my writing is impossible to read. And if you can't read it, just tell me. Or you don't know what I'm saying, just tell me. But I'm just giving you a flashcard. Fixed costs are up, operating leverage is up. Fixed costs are down, operating leverage is down. Okay, so the idea here is what? If you can generate enough revenue to basically cover your fixed cost, then what? Then any revenue above that threshold is going to go directly to profit. Therefore, you are said to have a high operating leverage. Okay, so let's just take a look at some of the implications. Okay, and a company with high operating leverage must produce sufficient revenue to cover its high fixed operating costs. High operating costs is beneficial when sales revenue is high because you're going to get that high revenue and everything after that fixed cost number is going to start to go to profit. A high contribution margin indicates a high operating leverage. Why don't you go ahead and flashcard that part? I didn't originally plan to have you flashcard that, but yeah, contribution margin is what? is sales price minus variable cost gives us contribution margin. So if we've got low variable costs, high sales, then we have a bigger contribution margin, gonna quickly cover those fixed costs and then we're gonna start to go into the profitability range, okay? A company with a high operating leverage will have greater risk, um, uh, <clears throat> will have greater risk but greater possible returns 
there's a risk that the variability of profits is greater when there is higher operating leverage. Because again, you got to get over that hurdle and you have a decline in sales. Now all of a sudden, you know, we're having a loss situation. So when sales decline, a company with high operating leverage may struggle to cover its fixed costs. However, beyond the break-even point, a company with higher fixed costs will remain a higher percentage of additional revenue, et cetera. Okay, and I think we've already said that. So why don't you go ahead and flashcard that, that sort of logic, because that tends to be, and I'm not going to go into, um, well, I guess this example I will go into um, for this operating leverage is Pat Jones. Okay, and I'm having you flashcard that because maybe they might give you a scenario and then ask you to determine if Jones has a higher, um, you know, potential for, um, <clears throat> you know, for, um, higher earnings or not. So when Pat Jones compared his company's operating leverage with the competitor's operating leverage, Jones found that he experienced a 21% increase in earning before interest in taxes as a result of a 5% increase in sales, while the competitor experienced a 10% increase in um, EBIT as a result of a 5% increase in sales. So Jones has a what? higher operating leverage than the competitor, okay? I mean, it kind of begs the question, well, up there, you know, they talked about in terms of industry, so who's this competitor? But anyway, never mind. We'll just let it go at that, okay? Okay, good. Now we come over and the other leverage that um, we spoke about here in the beginning of the leverage discussion is financial leverage. And it's to the degree that the company uses debt rather than equity to finance the company. Now, when we say debt, we mean fixed interest debt, okay? Fixed interest debt. So think about this. If you borrowed some money and now you're sitting there and you know you have to cover that fixed interest payment, well, if you cover that fixed interest payment, then what? Then any amount you make over that uh, threshold to cover that fixed interest payment is going to make you more profitable, okay? So you have what? You have higher operating leverage, but you're gonna be more risky because if you don't cover that, then you're gonna really start to have some problems. In fact, you know, it starts to become the question, can you even cover the debt service? So a company that issues debt must produce sufficient EBIT to cover its fixed interest costs. However, once fixed interest costs are covered, the additional EBIT will go straight to net income and earnings per share. A higher degree of financial leverage implies a relatively small change in earnings before interest in taxes will have a greater effect on the profits and shareholders value. Okay. Now, uh, again, this has to be fixed. Um, just on a side, um, you know, somebody was asking, well, it was on a news program that I was watching. The person was asking the financial expert there, um, how come we keep raising the interest rate, but the prices of homes seem to be staying stuck at a higher level? And the person made a good observation that a lot of people locked in, you know, long term fixed interest amounts uh, when the interest rates like during COVID got to you know, ridiculously low levels. I mean, I'll just tell you, I got it locked in at a 2.75. Well, I don't want to sell my house because I don't want to give up that, that low interest rate now is one of the major factors that an interest rate that low, um, I'm paying more towards my principal. It's a relatively new debt, new house that I have. I'm paying more towards principal than interest each payment, which generally doesn't happen until well into the loan. And so that's the kind of um, financial leverage that a company uh, might be looking for, okay? Now, um, another benefit of financial leverage is that interest costs are tax deductible, okay? Um, now, that's all the good news, okay? And so um, you can go ahead and underscore that implication on profit and shareholder value, flashcard that piece of what I highlighted. 
The you know sad part is that companies that are highly leveraged may be at risk of bankruptcy if they're unable to make payments on the debt. So, you know, that's the big downside on that is if you're not able to cover the debt, then what? Okay. Okay, good. Um, now, come over. I'm not going to read that example. Okay, but let's just look at the value of a leveraged firm. Okay. And the, again, here we go with the formulas, the value of a leveraged firm, a leveraged firm is a company that has debt in its capital structure, whereas an unleveraged firm has only equity in its structure. The formula for calculating the value of a leveraged firm is shown below, and it's the value of the unleveraged firm plus the present value of interest tax savings. And you can see that formula there. Let me give you that information. Corporate tax rate, because the you know debt is deductible, so you have to apply that to the interest. Okay, and that will give you the value of the um, present value of the interest savings. So if you look at this particular example, okay, the value of the company with no debt is 130 million. So if I'm working my CPA exam problem, I go for, you know, when they give you something, you write that down, right? The company has recently issued 25 million in debt at an interest rate of 5.7%, but they have this, what, this tax rate of 30%. So they go ahead, figure out the after um, tax portion of the, um, of the, and that one is the uh, tax rate, okay? And then the um, interest on that, and they go ahead and they give you then the um, value of the leverage firm when you do that math. Okay. Is this another formula we need memorized? Yeah, yeah. Again, um, Unfortunately, all the formula, whether I talk to you about them or not, I would memorize. And I, the good news is that you already have the flashcards. When we were negotiating this package with Becker, um, I I insisted we would get the package with the flashcards because you know you can take a lot of time making the cards. So they're there already to a large extent, but if they're not, so the reason I'm saying flashcard, if they're not, I want you to put them. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that the exam thinks that memorizing a formula like this is a measure of how good of a certified public accountant you're gonna be, because I disagree. To me, if they're going to uh, make us look at this stuff as CPAs, they should give us the formula, but the examiners don't tell us they tell they don't we don't tell them they tell us i'm frankly of the opinion that they shouldn't even be bothering us with half of this stuff that's in here in the business accounting and reporting section of the exam but again they don't ask us so the best advice i can give you is yeah just memorize them i didn't get actual flashcards they just had them online is that all we get now it's the electronic flashcards okay. yeah yeah, um, <clears throat> I would recommend, you can get them on your phone though, right? So I think the best thing is to do them on your phone because that's to me is more flashcardy <clears throat> than the way you go through them. You can go through them on your computer, but what I like about the phone is the phone travels with you. And so if you're stuck on transit or something like that, don't do it while you're driving. Okay, but you know, if you're stuck on transit or something, you can, you know, go through and keep memorizing the cards. Once you've got them all memorized, then you can go from there. But on occasion, um, Candice, there will be cards that I, you know, I've told you a flashcard that you don't see, you know, and from that standpoint, then you're gonna have to flashcard them. You have to make them physically. So it's probably not a bad investment to go to, um, <clears throat> you know, Costco or somebody like that and then get a bunch of flashcards and, um, you know, start not a bunch of them, but a package of them in case you have to move some by hand.
Okay. Um, what do I want to do here? I want to take the break because we're up on 630. So why don't we go ahead and uh, take the break right now. I'm showing 630. Close enough. 6.30, and why don't we go ahead and come back at 6.45, guys. Give you next time to grab something, a snack or something, and we'll pick up in about 15 minutes, okay? I'm going to pause the recording. Somebody remind me to unpause it. Recording. Okay, and I'll um, get those, the one from last one and this one posted up. Um, I should have some time on Thursday uh, to do that. Uh, so be looking for those recordings, assuming you uh, need them. So moving into module two and the approach with module two is we do, as I've stated a couple of times now, start to get really deep off on uh, the deep end on some of these formula one after another. For that, I'm gonna ask you to look at some of that on your own and what I'm going to focus on is more the theoretical discussion as to why and wherefore uh, we're looking at these different uh, aspects. So when we're talking about working capital, okay, working capital tends to be, well, by definition, I shouldn't say tends to be the difference between current assets and current liabilities. Obviously, a company wants to have a positive working capital, but also they want to manage that in a way where they're going to be able to have uh, short-term uh, liquidity, right? So uh, we start looking at cash, then we look at inventory, the asset side and the liability side. We're going to mainly focus on uh, notes payable, okay? Now, uh, let's take a look at cash and cash equivalents, guys. This is more a concept for the FAR exam. Cash equivalents are highly liquid instruments that have an original maturity of the purchaser of 90 days or less. So a classic example of a cash equivalent would be a T-bill. Would it be a um, certificate of deposit, okay? But motives for holding cash, and let's go ahead and flashcard the nature of some of these motives for holding cash, okay? And so we have what they may hold a transaction motive, Company holds cash to meet payments arising from the ordinary course of business. Cash may be needed to take advantage of temporary opportunities. Um, precautionary, make sure they have enough cash to maintain a safety cushion for unexpected needs. You know, kind of uh, common sense, almost what you might think about in your own situation for making sure you have liquid cash, right? Now, coming over and taking a look at... Um, the next page and looking at some of the methods, okay, for uh, managing cash. Okay, and let's just take a look um, at methods for speeding collections, okay. Um, and so customer screening and credit policy, okay, customers that tend to pay their bills on time, those are the ones that you'd want, credit rating, whatever, prompt billing. Person doesn't know if they're supposed to pay you until you pay uh, until you pay them. Offering payment discounts. Okay, now of course you want to balance that carefully. You know you could give huge discounts and people will pay you sooner. But then again, if the discount's too great, you're missing out on you know some cash that you could have been collecting on just as a timely basis. Um, expedite deposits. Okay, and there's a couple of ways of ex to buy ex expediting uh, deposits. One is to use electronic funds transfer, right? So we don't have to wait for the check to clear the bank and all that. That's going to happen much faster in an EFT environment. Lockbox system, and I'm not talking about a box with a lock on it. I'm talking about services that banks offer, usually larger banks, in which the payment is made directly to the bank. So it doesn't have to first come to the customer. I mean, comes from the customer to the uh, company. Um, it goes directly to the bank. So flashcard these different ways of um, expediting cash collections. Okay. Now you come over and we talk about factoring. Okay. And factoring 
and let's just flashcard this definition, is basically when we turn over our accounts receivable to a third party, that third party is going to charge us some cost, okay? So let's say the accounts receivable is for a hundred dollars, okay, a thousand dollars, whatever. Well, what the factor is going to do is they're gonna say, well, look, yeah, it's a thousand dollars, but I'll give you $980 on that. I'm gonna keep the 20 as a factoring fee, and then I'm gonna have a factor margin here. And then if I collect on the entire amount eventually, I may give you, you know, if it was a thousand and they gave us 980, I'll give you $15 of that 20. The extra five that the factor is keeping in that case is their compensation for the fact that they gave you the money early, right? And a company may do this uh, because they're trying to figure out, you know, a way of getting their cash collections faster. Okay. So that's all factoring is. And they give us this sort of detailed example down here. I'm not gonna go through the example guys because there is no standardized way that these factors work, okay? Just know that the factor does what? The factor takes the receivable in exchange. They're not gonna give you the full thousand dollars in our little example. They'll give you 980, they keep 20 just in case they don't, get payment on those receivables that they just acquired from you, right? So they give themselves a little margin, a little cushion. And then they'll say, okay, once I collect on everything, then I'll give you only $15 back. I keep five and that's the money that I'm keeping to earn on this, um, on this deal for the factor because the factor's got to make a profit on it, right? Okay, all right. So those are some cash management. We'll come back and talk about the payable side here. In a little while and they're kind of organizing this um uh, you know by looking at cash as an asset versus payables of course payables when you make the payable you debit the account payable you credit the cash but we'll get to payables when we talk about liabilities let's stick with the discussion of inventory now as you know there are different types of inventory um We'll get into more of these different types of inventory of, of materials as we go through a cost accounting discussion where we'll talk about raw materials, work and process and finished goods. So you can kind of hold, you know, that whole discussion for when we get into the cost accounting, I think in chapter three. Okay, but let's go ahead and let's just start to take a look at ways to manage our inventory. Okay, and the question being, you know, if you maintain huge inventory levels, then you'd never have a stock out situation. Stock out is when a customer comes to buy something and it's not there. And so they walk down the street and they go to your uh, competitor who has the thing in stock. You know, I'm of the opinion that one of the things they learned during COVID is we'll line up for stuff. And so now... Nothing ever seems to be in stock, at least nothing I want. I always seem to have to wait, you know, the obligatory six to eight weeks before you can get the stupid thing you want. But anyway, um, so they figure out a way to really kind of minimize these storage costs. Okay. But uh, let's just go ahead and take a look at factors influencing inventory, the storage cost, insurance costs. They're going to have to carry fire insurance and whatnot on the things they hold in, in inventory opportunity cost of inventory investment. If you've invested in inventory, then maybe you're not gonna be able to invest in something else like maybe a financial instrument or something. And then loss of inventory due to uh, obsolescence or spoilage. And so I guess they don't even really, um, they worry up here more about lost sales, but I guess these days everybody figures, okay, well, you know, People will just wait for the stuff, okay? But go ahead and flashcard, um, you know, these different factors that can, um, are carrying costs associated with inventory. The thing that you can add here to is what uh, theft and shrinkage, you know, kind of synonymous terms. Shrinkage is usually a nice way of saying people steal stuff from you. Um, you know, I notice that it depends on the neighborhood. You know, um, I live in Hayward and when I go 
to you know a CVS and Hayward and I want to pick up a couple things, there's nothing on the shelf. You have to go ask somebody to open everything or, hey, we don't carry that much inventory, et cetera. You go to another CVS and another part of, you know, the Bay Area and they got everything sitting out there, you know, so there's all these different factors that go into, um, you know, the level of inventory that's going to be carried. Okay. Now, when you come over optimal levels of inventory and what we're going to consider is these different ways of figuring out the optimal level of inventory. So um, let's take a look at and they give us some terms here, but let's just look at the notion of the reorder point, okay? When should we reorder more inventory? And again, guys, we get another formula. And in a couple of minutes here, I'm gonna sort of, you know, punt on all these formula, but let's just go ahead and let's flashcard this one, okay? So the reorder point is whatever safety stock we want to maintain. So a company may want to just make sure, hey, we got to have this much stock and whether it's finished goods or raw material, if the same principle would apply, okay? And then what is our lead time? Um, then we want to add on to that whatever lead time we need to get enough inventory to meet our sales. And so we would go ahead or whatever amount of inventory we need to, to um, build up to the amount we need to cover our sales. So that's going to be the lead time times the sales during the lead time. So you take a look at this question and this worldwide widget sells 8,000 units per year, manufactures widgets in groups of 1,500. Now I look at that manufactures widgets in groups of 1,500 and that is not relevant to what we're doing here. So I guess in this example, they decided to throw in a distractor that a CPA question might give you. Okay, it requires five weeks to lead time for widget production worldwide. Also maintains absolute safety stock of 1,200. Guys, with these formula, always take that low hanging fruit, write it down. I know I gotta have 1,200, right? Okay, my safety stock. And then they tell us, assume a 50 week year, I guess they have, you know, a couple of weeks of vacation, I guess, where the company is shut down, whatever. Okay, again, you don't argue with the CPA exam question. So worldwide sells an average of 160 widgets per week. That's 8,000 widgets per year divided by the assumption of the 50 week year, right? So what do we say? If it takes them and they say it requires five weeks of lead time to for widget production, and we have what? We do 160 widgets per week, then to produce 160 widgets, it's going to take us five weeks. So we have the 12. And so we add that additional, what is that 800? And that gives us now 2000 widgets is our reorder point or where we would have to order whatever it is we're gonna need to produce these widgets. Okay. Okay, good, or they, I guess they order the widgets. Okay, not too difficult. Economic order quantity, okay? And basically what this economic order quantity uh, assumption does is there is a, a a perfect point to order the inventory so that we minimize the total ordering and carrying costs. Okay, so flashcard that notion if that's what we're doing, and then go ahead and flashcard this formula. Now, when you look at this formula, you got the square root. You know. Um, and I remember when I was taking the exam, we couldn't use calculators. And so I was all flipped out about how the hell am I gonna be taking square root without a calculator? But what I typically found was that the numbers inside of the square root were always something that you like, you know, could kind of figure out the square root in your head. Okay, so square root of four is two kind of thing. Okay, so typically they'll make the numbers inside the square root be pretty easy to calculate or it'll come to a number that is then easy to take the square root of and you can probably do that in your head. Okay, but you take a look and E is the economic order quantity. Okay, 
two, you just remember that you have to put the two there, and then sales in units, okay, cost per purchase order, and the annual carrying costs. And again, that work inside the square root usually comes out to something that you can off the top of your head, it'll be a nine. Okay, well, that's a three. Okay, that kind of thing. Okay. All right, good. You know, there is some, um, <clears throat> there's an example here. I'm not going to go through the example with you. It's just simply pl plugging in the numbers. But there is a mathematical theory behind this. They take the derivative of a formula for these different factors, and that's how they come up with this way to minimize the economic um, cost of inventory or the economic order and quantity. Okay. <clears throat> okay, good. Uh, coming over, and they start to give us some different um, types of inventory ways of um, dealing with the inventory uh, and, and minimizing the cost just in time inventory method. Okay. And it basically says, what is the best time to order inventory that will minimize those costs? Okay. Computerized inventory system is going to do what? It's going to allow communication between the um, cashier in the stock room and every purchase is recognized instantaneously by an inventory database and computers are programmed to alert inventory managers as to reorder requirements. And in some cases will interface directly with the supplier and there will be an automatic ordering of inventory, okay? Um, now the only thing, and it really kind of beyond the scope of the bar exam, um, this is more an auditing issue. Um, you know, you'd have to be careful that if you're going to allow someone to access your inventory system outside the company in a business to business type environment, that you make sure that they have, you know, file, they have computer system that is going to corrupt your system. But that's not something that we need to worry about in the bar exam. Okay, now come over and let's take a look at accounts payable management. So we understood the notion of, um, you know, managing cash. And we talked about speeding the collection of receivables or, uh, well, let's see if there's some way that we can delay payables. And by delaying payables, I don't mean stiffing people and not paying them when you're supposed to, but what is the proper time to pay them? And should we take advantage of discounts that they give us? Okay, so you try to start to take a look at this and they say the effective annual interest costs may be extremely high if discounts are offered and then not taken. And so we want to figure out, well, what is the uh, effect, the annual, uh, uh, the annual uh, cost of a quick payment discount assuming a 360 day year. By the way, uh, the CPA exam um, assumes a 360 day year for most calculations. Um, so sometimes students have trouble with that because they're like, well, why wouldn't it be 365 day year? Well, um, we don't have a problem if we buy an asset and we want to figure out what its annual depreciation is. We sit there and um, you know divide that uh, or the annual amount, we divide that by 12. That's assuming every month has what has 30 days in it, which would be a 360 day year. So we do that more in accounting than you may even, you know, realize up front. Okay. So if you take a look, and again, guys, another formula. I know the formula thing is getting a little old here, but you take the 360 day year. Okay. And what is the pay period? Typically 30 days. What is the discount period? Often. 10 days, okay? So that would be 360 divided into 20. That's basically telling you what? How many 30-day pay payment periods do you have in the year, okay? Uh, or 20-day payment periods do you have in the year? And then we'll take the discount and then we take, you know, the 100 minus the discount. And that's going to tell us what, multiplying that's going to tell us what the cost is the percentage associated with not taking the discount, okay? So you come over and we have this example and we have this uh, Trivana 
companies, main vendors offer quick payment discount, 110 net 30. I know if you got this far, you know that that's a 1% discount if we pay in 10 days. Otherwise, we're going to have to pay the entire amount in 30 days. And just using the formula from the previous page, right? We go ahead, plug those in. And the what the annual cost of not taking a discount is 18.2%. Okay, let's make sure um, we are, are saying what this is when you put it on your flashcard is the cost of not taking the discount. Okay. That's what we mean by APR, quick payment discount, if you don't take it. Okay, that's not what you save by taking it. That Well, I guess you could look at conversely and say, it's what I save if I don't take it, uh, if I do take it. But it's more talked about the cost of not taking it. Okay, okay, good. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's look. It's been a while since we've looked at a question. So let's look at a question. Look at some of these. Okay, and I'll give you uh, two minutes for this first one and I'll go ahead and put up the poll. Okay, it looks like everyone had a chance to do this one. We're, that's good. We're about a minute 20. Um, you know, at this stage of your understanding, I don't really focus too much on time. I give you two minutes in class. By the time you're on the CPA exam, you should be about a minute and a half per question, which is what you just did in this particular one. Uh, some questions may take longer. Some should take less time. Some questions maybe take 30 seconds. Some questions may take, and I tell you, never go over three minutes. If you're working a multiple choice question, and I'm talking about multiple choice questions here now, and it takes you more than three minutes to work that question, make your best choice and move on. Okay. Uh, they may, they do allow you to mark a question, you may choose to mark that question if you're still wanting to go back and look. My rule is do not mark any more than five questions. I don't want you marking every single question in there and then you lose the value of the marking. So don't try not to mark any more than five questions. And then as you're ready to leave a testlet, if you look and you've already exceeded the amount of time that you had allotted to that testlet, choose your best choice mark the question if you still have some doubt, and then only go back if you have time left 
in the module because by the time you've spent three minutes with the question, you've probably already increased your chances of answering that tremendously, that it's not worth your time to go back. If you have a cushion of time, then sure, go back and maybe take a look at a couple of the uh, ones that you marked, okay? Uh, so on average, minute and a half per question. Um, reality, some questions will take you 30 seconds. Some questions might take you three, never more than three. You just did this one in a minute and a half and everybody got it right, as you can see, okay? So let's just go ahead and take a look at this one. And uh, um, which of the following, well, this one should probably, uh, uh, this isn't the question I wanted to look at. Okay, well, let's look at it anyway. Which of the following would increase the working capital of a, uh, of a um, firm? And this first one, I guess this is a good question. Uh, cash collection of accounts receivable. No, you're just trading one current asset for another, right? Okay. Um, cash payment of accounts payable, you're simply what? You're simply sitting there and reducing both the numerator and the denominator of the current ratio. So that's not going to help the work. Well, working capital is what is current assets minus current liabilities. That's not even a ratio. So what would happen there? That would just net that out. Okay. Payment of a 30 year mortgage with cash, that's going to actually do what? reduce your working capital, refinancing an account payable with a two-year note, yeah, you've gotten rid of a current liability. So you've increased the, you decrease the current liability section side of that equation, and that would uh, increase the working capital. Okay. Now, current ratio, okay, even though we didn't talk about it, is what current assets divided by current liabilities. Okay, so let me just lecture that little point right there. And then let's go ahead and take a look at this one. Okay, looks like everyone, not everybody. I got one more person, I'll give you more time. Okay, now everybody's had a chance. Okay, 75% of us got this right, okay? And so when you look at this question, guys, one of the first things, the answer is D, one of the first things you need to look at is say, well, if they're asking me what is the effect for the current ratio and what is the effect for net profit, okay, before you think about direction, they're asking me which of these describes something that will have both a balance sheet and an income statement effect, right? Because income statement is profitability and balance sheet is current assets and current liabilities. So when I first look at this question, I'm like, well, is the, these better have both balance sheet and income statement effects. So does 
a payment of a federal income tax payment due from a previous year have both the balance sheet and the income statement effect? Is there an income statement effect for A? No, because it would have been the uh, previous year. Previous year, so presumably, I guess there would have been some tax payable from the previous year that I'm paying this year. Okay, and so what happens? That's a pure balance sheet effect. Okay, good. How about long-term bond is retired before maturity at a discount? Okay, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, well, okay, if it's retired before maturity at a discount, there could be a gain or loss associated with early retirement of debt. So that could have what? An income statement balance sheet effect. So I'm gonna look at this next one. C, dividend is paid. If a dividend is paid, is there any income statement effect? I don't think anybody picked this, right? No, we're gonna debit dividend payable, we're gonna credit cash. So, okay, let's look at D, vacant land is sold for less than its book value. So if the book value is what? Book value is 100 and I sell the thing for what? For 80 cash, I'm going to have a loss. If this is the book value. I'm going to have a loss of what? A loss of 20. That's going to decrease my net profit. And it's going to do what? It's going to increase my current ratio because my current asset cash is going to go up and there's no effect on any other current asset or, of course, there's no effect on current liability. So that is the correct answer. Now you look at B, if long-term debt is uh, retired before maturity at a discount, what happens? That means I'm going to take, what, maybe $100 of debt off of my books, okay? And it's only going to do what? It's going to cost me, say, I'm just making these numbers up, guys, but at a discount, it only cost me $90 cash. That difference is what? Is a gain, isn't it? Okay, so it's not going to decrease my profitability. And the long-term bond being retired is going to what? Use up some cash. That's going to decrease my current ratio, not increase it. Why are the people with their camera on looking at me like I just like a spaceship just landed? Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I always tell when I vet new instructors, I had a role with Becker, not so much these days where I bring in new instructors to teach throughout the Bay Area. And I would always tell them, if your students look at you like a spaceship just landed, that's not a good thing. Don't think they're in awe of you. That means they didn't understand what you just said, but we're okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. Now, um, let's come over and I wanted to find these two questions also are good. So we'll get a little rash of questions here. Okay. So let's take a look at this one and I'll relaunch the poll. Where'd my poll go?
Okay, guys, we're at two minutes. I'll give you a little more time. Got one person still coming in with this. Ten seconds. Okay, we're coming in at two minutes and 30 seconds on this. My fourth person did not answer. Um, guys, you need to answer. Um, I don't care if you get the wrong answer. If you get the wrong answer when you're working this in here half the time, it sounds horrible, right? That means you're two thirds of the way there. You only need a 75 to pass the exam. And by going through and doing the problem and then maybe getting it wrong and seeing, well, this was how we did it, that is an incredibly powerful reinforcement as to the concepts that we're learning. So you're in here, you're gonna spend you know, three hours with me looking at this wonderful stuff that we have to look at in the beginning of bar. Some of the other stuff will be more stimulating later, I'm thinking, you know, then you, you need to, you know, exercise that time okay all right good so let's just go ahead and everybody got it right the answer is d and it is simply where they're talking about the cost of the cash discount not taken remember i asked you to put that on the uh flash card accordingly to call it the way the exam questions and they tell us that the formula for that is to take the 360 okay then you take the payment period minus the discount period. So that tells us how many discounted um, or uh, discount payment periods we have. And then we are to do what? Take the interest, the discount interest or the discount percentage, I should say. And then one my, 100 minus that discount, that gives us, when you do the math on that, 36.73, I think which basically translated to 36.7 is the cost of not taking those discounts, okay? Um, I mean, you look at something like this and it seems like a company would always take a discount. I mean, I can't think of where you're gonna get a better return than 36.7%. It seems like, you know, the idea would be to take that discount, right? Okay, or if you have limited uh, cash, you know, you've got cash management issues. Another way to look at this is what, take the discounts that have the highest cost first, take those, and if there's some you can't meet, let the ones with the lower cost go, right? Okay, okay, good. Let's go ahead and take a look at this one. Let's get everybody to respond to this one. Okay, good, excellent. Everybody tried it and everyone got that right. An increase of the um, cost, let me put the results up. Okay, everybody got that right. The increase in which of the following should cause management to reduce the average inventory, the cost of carrying the inventory, right? These other things we're going to do what are going to cause you to maybe want to carry larger amounts of inventory. Okay, good. So coming back to the current book. Okay. And uh, let's take a look 
at some corporate banking arrangements. Definitional things here, guys, but I figure it's worth us spending some time together just so you can uh, you know, see where I'm saying you ought to make some flashcards around some of this stuff. So not going to spend a lot of time with it, but I think you know some of these terms. But let's go ahead and at least indicate potential for flashcards. Okay, so letter of credit. Okay, a letter of credit represents a third party's guarantee of financial obligations incurred by a company. Okay, letters of credit represent an external credit enhancement used by companies. Okay, and so go ahead and flashcard that. I think you probably know that already, but let's just flashcard that. A line of credit represents a result, a revolving loan with a bank or group of banks that is up to a specific dollar maximum. Okay, flashcard that. All of these, again, are ways of managing um, your working capital, right? Coming over, debt covenants, okay? And creditors use debt covenants and lending agreements to protect their interests by limiting or prohibiting the actions of debtors that might negatively, ah, I'm having one of those nights, that might negatively affect the position of the creditors, okay? Um, common debt covenants. Okay, let's look at that. Limitations on issuing additional debt, restrictions on payment of dividends, limitation on disposal of certain assets, okay? Limitations on borrowing, uh, borrowed money can be used. Minimum working capital requirements. Maintenance of financial ratios. Debt to ratio, debt to capital ratio. Okay. Maximum debt to earning before interest in taxes and depreciation amortization. Minimum interest coverage ratio times interest earned. Okay. So why don't you go ahead and, um, yeah, flash card these typical debt covenants, okay? Now, if I'm the borrower, why would I agree to this? What's the motivation of the borrower? And I'm opening it up for that question to agree to this. I mean, really restriction on payment of dividends? Hey, don't get up in my face and tell me whether I'm gonna pay dividend. Why would I agree to that? It'd be less risky for the lenders. Maybe they'd give you a lower interest rate. Yeah, exactly. Okay, all of these are done. Thank you, um, Gage, that's perfect. All of this is done to do what? Lower the interest rate on the loan. Okay, because the way we describe it here, it sounds like, you know, oh, it almost sounds like the borrower is the one saying, yeah, oh God, I want to do these things. These are being imposed on us. And usually the, the exchange is, hey, well, we'll give you a lower interest rate. Okay, good. Now you come over and um, start to take a look at financing decisions and working capital. And guys, this stuff is pretty, you know, easy, but let's just go ahead since we, we're going to spend some time with it here and just look at these. Okay, short-term financing, rates associated with short-term financing. I'm having trouble talking tonight. Short-term financing tend to be lower. Okay, less risk to the bank. If they lock you in, I mean, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I think some of the problems that some of the financial institutions had there, that little rash of uh, failures was that they had locked in long-term rates and then the rates started spiking up all of a sudden. I mean, that can put you in the poorhouse pretty quickly. Okay, so what happens? If it's a short term, I'll give you a long, uh, lower rate. Long term, I got to protect myself in case there's an increase in interest rates. Okay, so the effect on working capital short term financing is classified as a current liability and decreases um, the uh, working capital. Okay, so if you need to flashcard that, you can. Okay, now <clears throat> you come over in advantages and. Um, the CPA exam loves advantage, disadvantage questions. As we go through this material, every time I think you see an advantage, disadvantage discussion, the next word out of my mouth is going to be what? Flashcard. Okay. CPA exam loves these yin and yang type questions, advantage, disadvantage. Okay. So what is the advantage 
increased profitability, rapid conversion of operating cycle components into cash to meet short-term obligations, carry potential increased profitability, improved liquidity, decreasing finance uh, cost uh, is an obvious if it's going to be lower interest rates, right? Okay. By the way, if you need the flashcard, the uh, idea of lower interest rates with short-term financing, you can do that. Okay. Disadvantage of short-term financing is going to be increased interest rate risk. Okay. The rate may abruptly change given shorter maturities requiring greater financing changes than anticipated on future refinancing. I mean, to me, when you talk about the public debt and everyone always worries about the federal government's public debt, what is it? Almost, is it over 30 trillion now? Okay, whatever that number is. The problem with that number is not so much the size of the number, although that is a problem, but relative to GDP, the federal government, the United States is still not a, amongst the highest debtor nations. The problem is, is that two thirds of that debt is in short term financing. And so what happens is they roll over two thirds of that 30 trillion every year. Imagine you had a mortgage on your house and you had to roll that over two thirds of it every year. You'd be sitting there with a gun to your head because if interest rates spike, what are you going to do? That's going to all of a sudden eat up all of the federal budget to make uh, uh, interest payments. Um, the problem that the federal government has is the right, you know, the world looks for a safe haven to park their short-term cash. And so they have to make those short-term instruments available so that different countries that want to park their money or different institutions, pension plans and that, they want to park short-term money in a risk-free, and I do the risk-free, because if the federal government started to default on its debt, then it wouldn't be risk-free anymore. Where would What would be the risk-free rate of return? You would destroy a highly effective ve uh, vehicle for parking short-term uh, cash if you defaulted on the debt, but also if you didn't have those short-term securities as readily available as they are to the amount that they're available. So the federal government's got that balance. They just can't manage it like a company would, which would be to say, okay, um, you know, we're going to park all that long because they never going to pay off the federal debt. Let's put it all in long-term financing so we don't have that interest rate exposure. They can't do that. Okay. Um, now, decreased capital availability, uh, lender evaluation and credit worthiness may change over time. So yesterday you could have borrowed, you know, a million dollars, but your credit has changed and you can't borrow that money or you can't borrow it as this attractive of an interest rate. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, come over and let's take a look at long-term financing. Okay. And it's sort of the mirror image of what we said for short-term financing, rates tend to be higher because now the lender is locked in, right? At that, and if interest rates start to change, they're going to have some problems, right? Uh, the effect on working capital, okay? Long-term uh, finance is classified as non-current and is not included in the calculation of working capital, okay? However, divid dividend interest and principal rate payments all require cash, which can reduce working capital over time. So the immediate effect is not that bad, but over time as you start making interest payments and whatnot, right? Now, um, the advantage disadvantage, let's flashcard that. And again, remember we're talking about now long-term and it's gonna be a mirror image of what we said for the short-term. Uh, for the borrower, long-term financing locks in investment rate over a longer period, thereby reducing exposure, exposure to fluctuation and increased capital, capital availability. Securing long-term debt guarantees financing over a long period and reduces the company's exposure to any risk that might uh, be denied or modified with less favorable terms. Disadvantage, decreased probability, higher interest, decrease for probability, increase financing costs, okay? The longer the duration, okay? All right, good. So let's go and let's look 
at another multiple choice question. And then I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna handle part of module three. Then we're gonna go through some other things in module three, and then we're gonna adjourn here, okay? But let's just go ahead and let's take a look at another question. This one right here. Oh, put the poll. Ten seconds. I got uh, one person that I'm waiting for. Okay. All right. So um, surprisingly, only half of us, two of us got this one right. Okay. But um, let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And a couple of things here. What would be the primary reason? Now, when you see that, that's telling you, stop here. When you see that, that's telling you, hey, there could be two or more reasons why they want me to pick the best reason. What would be the motivation of the company for doing this? The best motivation for a company to agree to a debt covenant limiting the percentage of its long-term debt. That means what? The company borrowing? Okay, so you got to figure out who are they talking about here and realize that there could be more than one reason. Now, to cause the co co price of the company's stock to rise, okay, I don't see that a debt covenant is going to really, it's not one of the factors that we look at contributing to stock price. Okay, oh, geez, you have all these debt covenants, so let me buy your stock. Okay, so that doesn't really sound like a primary reason. Let's not exit out yet. Let's leave it, okay? To lower the company's bond rating. Well, I don't think anybody picked that. Why would a company do anything that would want to lower its bond rating? To reduce the risk for its existing bondholders. Okay, maybe that might be something they're thinking about because everybody knows that a person wakes up in the morning and worries about their creditors and their well-being. But let's just go ahead and let's look at the last one to reduce the coupon rate on the bonds being sold. Yeah, 
that's a what? That's a motive that goes directly to the company's um, profitability and maximization of the wealth of the company. Okay. So no, these other things, I mean, you might kind of consider these things, but no, the primary reason is D. Okay. Okay, good. Then we come over. I'm going to get out of this. And come back to the new book. Okay. And let's start to take a look at these financial valuation methods. Now, what we're looking at is to say, what would be the value? What should I pay for an investment? How would I value an investment? When we say investment, yes, I know investments in stocks and that kind of thing, yes. But it could also be investment in property, plant, and equipment, okay? Now, when they look at these things, when they start looking at all this, okay? This, guys, is where they go into formula hell. And I'm going to have to ask you to look at this material Look at what Becker has recorded for this. Make the flashcards of the formula. Apply your memorization of the formula to the questions. I'm not going to sit here for two days reading off formulas to you and saying this is how, you know, here's the example of the formula. It's just our time is not worth, it's not worth our time to do that. Okay, we have limited time together and you can see it starts to become ratio, formula, ratio, formula, formula, ratio, ratio. And I don't like lectures where I'm just sitting here barking off these formula to you, okay? So do look at this material. I'm not telling you not to look at it, but I would rather spend some time looking at more some of the theoretical discussion for valuing different types of um investments and then more importantly valuing investments in um, property plant and equipment valuing investments in intangible assets and coming up with values when we are required to use fair value for things so that's what we're going to look because that becomes more theoretical than just some geniuses formula that came up uh, and I, I'm not using genius facetiously there. Some of these people are geniuses that come up with this stuff, but I just don't see that it's worth our time for me to see that. Here's another flashcard, okay? So what I want to do is I want to come over and talk about the option pricing model, okay? And this is very easy, okay? An option is a contract that entitles the owner to buy or sell an option or price that's stated at a point in time. We talked about call and put options last time, okay? Um, now you come over and there are different factors that enter into the determination of value of the option. And a common method one is called the Black-Scholes model. And the key thing you have to understand here, it's beyond the scope. I don't know if it's extremely complex, but it is beyond the scope of the CPA exam. So if they're talking about the value of an option and really guys, accounting for stock options is something that we get into more in the FAR exam, they're gonna give you the option price. Okay, they're gonna give you, and we talk about it from the standpoint of options being provided to employees. Okay, okay, good. So I'm not gonna say much more about that, just know that there that's something that would be given to you on the exam so now, you want the flash card though sorry no well you could that the a, a model commonly used is the black shoals if you want to that might be in your head already i just wanted you to realize that the cpa exam will give you the value of an option essentially okay good coming over let's take a look at valuing tangible assets, okay? Now, when we talk about tangible assets, we're often talking about property, plant, and equipment, okay? So let's just go ahead and take a look at the valuing, and we could use the cost method, okay? And the cost method is based on the original cost paid to acquire the asset, 
okay? Um, and adjustments may be made for depreciation. That's property plan equipment, okay? Market value, okay? This method requires that similar assets be available in the marketplace in order to find a comparable value. We're going to talk about some of that process um, a little bit later, um, but they tell us that two iterations of the market value method are replacement cost method and net, real, net realizable value method. I don't remember having this much trouble talking in a class anytime recently, okay? But um, net realizable value method, um, we use this for inventory. Okay, and we'll get, you get more into this in the FAR exam, but these two methods, okay, market value method, um, I mean, replacement cost method and net realizable value method really get used more in the FAR exam for inventory. Okay, now appraisal method, and under the appraisal method, we have a what professional appraiser who can come in and determine the value of the asset. Okay. All right, good. So go ahead and you can flashcard those three methods, market value method, cost method, maybe do the flashcard this way, guys. What are three methods that can be used for valuing tangible assets, cost, market, appraisal, okay? And then you could also, I guess, say liquidation. If the asset was sold today, uh, liquidation, value is rarely used in any kind of accounting, but you can flashcard that as a method as well. Okay, now valuing intangible assets, okay? And for valuing intangible assets, we could use the market approach, okay? And uh, go ahead and flashcard that, okay? But it requires an actual arm's length transactions in similar markets to be used as a reference for the asset to be valued, okay? Income approach, and notice we didn't have this for our fixed assets, but because intangibles like patents and whatnot could potentially generate some cash, we could, what, uh, some income, we could use uh, ex future expected cash flows over the estimated useful life of the intangible, are discounted to present value, okay? And so you could use that income approach, okay? Cost approach is going to get into what, uh, okay? There aren't similar assets. Cost approach says, well, what did it cost you to develop that? And what would it cost you if you had to reproduce that item? And uh, they give us different examples here of the type of cost that could go into the development of an intangible. Okay, now you come over and you take a look at um, valuation using accounting estimates, okay? And preparing accounting estimates, management considers what is historical cost, okay? And that requires um, that we use an allowance for uncollectible and using estimated uncollectible levels, for example. Market information, the current value of inventory items sold used to be determined. What is the expected usage, the depreciation, okay? You could, what, well, could be based on expected patterns of use. Maybe you've had some previous experiment experience with this or you could get estimates from experts. You can flashcard these different ways of preparing and counting estimates. Okay, now you come over and they talk about, well, okay, determining these fair values and getting this information of similar assets and whatnot. Well, what FASB did some years back is they came up and they said, look, this is the system that we want you to use when you're coming up with these fair value measurements and whatnot. Okay, so this is a formalized system that a company would use. And this is really for reporting issues, okay? And so when you come down, we talk about fair value is a price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer liability in an orderly transaction between market participants. Okay, now what happens? 
when we say orderly transaction, okay, what does that mean? Everybody's nice to each other? No, it means that we're not having a fire sale. Think about it this way. You know, you have time to market your house. It's not that you can't make your payments or whatever. You have time to market it and get a good price for that. Okay. That's what we mean by orderly transaction. Now, when we talk about, and I want to just come down because you say, well, what is the principal market? Okay. And let's just go down and look at the definition of principal market. Okay. And the principal market is the market with the greatest volume or level of activity for the asset or liability. Okay. Um, Okay. What is the most advantageous market? Let's look at that. And I wanted, I think I had wanted to start there. Okay. And we say the price in the most advantageous market will be the fair value measurement only if there is no principal market. Okay. So flashcard those two terms. You should use the principal market, but if there is no principal market, then you use the most advantageous market. Now, when using the most advantageous market, it's the market with the best price, maximizing selling price or liability after considering transac transaction cost. Okay, note that although transaction costs are used to determine the most advantageous market, transaction costs are not included in the final fair value measurement. And they have a nice example down here, but I want you to flashcard that as well. OK, so what's the rules? If we're trying to come up with fair value, we look to the principal market. If there is no principal market, use the most advantageous market. Most advantageous market is where you get the best price after considering transaction costs. But when you finally report that fair value, you don't consider the transaction costs. That's the rules that we have flashcarded. Let's just take a look at this. And we have Garrity Inc. OK, has these securities. Okay, the security and exchanges on New York and London exchanges, whatever the London exchange is called. Okay, so New York, quoted price of 52, London 50. Okay, now what happens? Let's do the easy one first. If what? If New York is the principal market, use New York. If London is the principal market, use London. That's easy. Okay. But what if neither of these are the principal market? Then we go to the most advantageous rule. And after you consider transaction costs, what happens? London is the most advantageous. We don't report that 48, though. We report what? We report 50. OK? OK, good. Now, we've got a couple minutes left, and so um, yeah. Damn. I'm going to go for it, guys. Okay, I might go. Is it okay if I go a little over 8 o'clock? Okay, I might go maybe five minutes past 8. Okay, but let's just go ahead and let's take a look. Highest and best use for non-financial assets, okay? You have a truck or something. The fair value measurement of non-financial assets takes into account the market participants' ability to generate economic benefit by using the asset in its higher, highest and best use or by selling it to another market participant that would use it in its highest and best use, okay? Flashcard that. A reporting entity's current use of a non-financial asset is presumed to be the highest and best use unless market or other four factors suggest that a different use by market participants would maximize the value of the asset. Okay. Um, coming down. For liabilities, we don't use the highest and best use because there really is no highest and best use of a liability, okay? And their fair values do not depend on their use. Last card that. Come down, okay? And U.S. GAAP 
has given us a framework for measuring fair value, okay? And this framework for measuring fair value can be used to measure fair value and establish a hierarchy of inputs, okay? Now, when we look the valuation techniques that we can use, okay, we can use market approach, use prices and other relevant information for market transactions. We could use guys in, we're kind of having a little deja vu here, income approach, what income could be generated from this? What is the cost approach? Okay, so all of these would be available, market approach, and we've already flashcarded these. I'm just reminding you, income approach, cost approach. What I want you to flashcard here is the inputs, okay? And so we have a hierarchy of inputs. We have level one inputs, level two inputs, level three inputs. So let's just think about this. Let's say you have a stock and you're trying to figure out, well, what's the fair value of that stock? Because you're going to report that stock at fair value, okay? Level one inputs are quoted prices in active markets for identical assets or liabilities that the reporting entity has access to on the measurement date. Flashcard that. If I hold Apple stock and Apple stock is actually traded, I've got a level one input. Easy. Level two inputs, other than quoted market prices, that, that are directly or indirectly observable for an asset or liability, quota prices for similar assets or liabilities in active markets. Okay, makes sense. I don't have that exact one, but I have something similar. And so I can look, maybe I have a stock that isn't actively traded, but I can look to similar stocks that are actively traded and use that as a level two input. Level three input, and for level three input, I want you to put last resort okay this is what you should look to if you don't have the level one or level two inputs okay so this is used if there is no observable level one or level two inputs so the most important thing is what level three is what you use if there is no uh, level one or level two okay so flashcard that Okay. All right. Good. Um, coming down. Oh, that's it there. Okay, good. So we'll pick up module four next time, guys. Don't forget for module three, you got to go through that formula stuff, but you should be able to get into modules one through three now of chapter two. We'll finish chapter two next time. Other than what we've already talked about covered in chapter one, including module one in chapter one, uh, don't worry about that step. We'll get to some of that stuff a little further down the line, right? Okay, by the way, uh, one more thing I want to say in the one minute I have left here. Um, that discussion of fair value that we just went through, you will have deja vu when you look at the FAR material. This is why I'm of the opinion that bar is a good discipline to focus on because I see a tremendous overlap here than within any other part of the exam, okay, in the uh, FAR section. So you got to take FAR, you're learning this here, and then it's going to be transferable to what you do in FAR. Question. Uh, professor, could you uh, post, because I don't have my book yet, could you post... Um your highlighted uh, uh, version of this chapter, your PDF? Yeah. Yeah, I would have put it up at the beginning, but it made it sound like you had access to some other. Uh, well, yeah, I, I was just thinking, because I'm just here writing notes on them. I didn't I have my actual book to like highlight. And yeah, a lot, a lot of the yeah. flashcards are flashcards are just what you highlight. And so, yeah, I'll put it up. That's I, not appreciate, I appreciate that. OK, uh, I, I'll probably get it up tomorrow or no, no. And, Bad. Boy, I'm having trouble talking. I swear, guys, I didn't drink before class. I don't know why I can't talk. Um, I will uh, put it up. If I don't put it up tomorrow, I'll put it up on um, Thursday, okay? I'm usually sitting around my computer on Thursday. Okay. Question? 
All right, guys, I am going to end the recording and then I will see you next time, right?